This is Right Excuses, Season 7, Episode 17, Guns and Fiction. 15 minutes long. Because you're in a hurry. And we're not that smart. I'm Brandon. I'm Dan. I'm Mary. I'm Howard. And special guest star. I'm Larry. Larry Correa, author of various sundry and awesome books, many of which involve people shooting other people and or monsters. <laughs> Larry, give us a quick update on what you've got coming out so people can know. Uh, my next book coming out is Monster Hunter Legion, which is the fourth book in the uh, Monster Hunter International series. And, uh, yep, that's going to be good. A lot of, lot of face shooting in there. So, a lot of guns. Okay, <laughs> excellent. Excellent. By the way, we are recording live at Life, Universe, and Everything at UVU um, this time. So, here we have a live crowd. Go ahead and make some noise. <laughs> We don't have signs this time. We really need to get them. We um, get yeah, we'll get a whiteboard and use it. Okay. Uh, the reason I want to do this podcast is because I recently wrote a book um, about people who shoot other people, which is a very different thing for me <laughs> because I usually write books about people who stab other people um, <laughs> and or blow their faces off with magic. Um, and so in doing it, I learned several things, which is that um, unlike magic, you can do guns wrong and people know guns a lot better than I do. Um, this led to some interesting times after which I found an expert and had them read my book and tell me all the stupid things I did. Um, you may not have that luxury as a writer and so we have um, one of the world's foremost um, leading experts on what people do wrong in um, science fiction and fantasy when they write guns, Larry Correa. You, you qualified that pretty significantly yes, well, yeah. after saying world's foremost. Yeah, yeah I, um, I, I was a gun expert a long time before I was a fantasy writer. And uh, I wrote for gun magazines and I was a firearms instructor for about a decade. And just kind of a general all-around member of the gun culture. And let me tell you, they get everything wrong in books. And it's really awfully painful out there. We're going to go through today yes. some of the what mistakes. What we're going to do, we're going to really talk about mistakes. And boy, you know what? I thought the people who told me I was doing stuff wrong with horses were hardcore. Oh, no. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, no. The people who know their guns are more hardcore and they're armed. Yes. yes. <laughs> See, that's the thing. I'm very scared of my fan base. My fan base is awesome and terrifying. Okay. So we're just going to start by having Larry tell us some of the big mistakes that writers make using guns in their fiction. Um, first and foremost is people who've done little or no research on what guns are and how they actually work. And it's really infuriating when you're a gun nut and it just kicks you right out of the story when you're reading and it's something so simple that literally a minute on Wikipedia wouldn't screw it up uh, or, or would fix this problem. And it's where you take, in modern fiction, it'd be like taking a really common gun, like, oh, he took the safety off his Glock. Okay, that would be kind of like saying that you got into your car by crawling through the trunk. <laughs> and if you know anything about cars, you'd be like, huh? And it kicks you right out of the story. Um, so a Glock doesn't have a safety, is that what you're saying? A uh, Glock does not have a manual thumb safety. No, okay, there we go. And most revolvers don't either. Um, and Robert Ludlum, to the contrary, they, <laughs> oh my, no, never, I wouldn't get started. Um, so so most, <laughs> most handguns, you're saying, don't have a, a manual on-off safety? Many, many handguns do, many handguns do not. Okay, okay. And it's really quick and easy to just go check. Okay. Um, One thing, that in my day job, I work in theater, and I had to, to procure a Glock for a stage show. And this was a 99-seat house, so very, very small house. And when I was getting the gun, they told me that it had, that it ejected the shell casing in a 20-foot arc which you don't think about normally. <laughs> this is not something that you normally think about, but in a 20-seat house, I mean, it, in a 99-seat house, the, that meant that the shell casing was ejecting into the middle of the audience. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we wear safety glasses on the range for that reason. Mm. And, and it's hot. Yeah, yes. <laughs> and even with, with firing blanks, which were quarter charge, so not nearly the power, the, uh, the sound and the heat of the shell casing was pretty impressive. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a considerable amount of energy. And um, that's another pet peeve of mine is writers who write gunfight sequences who have never actually shot a gun. And it's very obvious when you read it. Okay, but give me the specifics. I want to know the specifics. Okay, without naming names. No, 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 not yeah. specifics of people who do it wrong. <laughs> um, for example, guns recoil. Um, guns have, there is a sensation to when you shoot a firearm. And if all you know about guns comes from watching TV and you're writing recoil based upon what you see on TV, you either have not enough or way too much. 
Um, when you're operating a weapon that's a manually operated weapon, like a pump shotgun, you don't have a dramatic pause. Bang, dramatic pause, pump. No, just pump the damn gun, shoot the gun. Um, <laughs> guns hold ammo. They do not hold an infinite amount of ammo depending <laughs> on your scene. Um, guns do not jam when it is necessary to have a hand-to-hand -hand combat sequence. <laughs> It's actually, I, there was one particular novel, it was, a, it was a military thriller, written by someone who should have known better, but I'm pretty sure was ghostwritten. And in this book, three times in this book, this Navy SEAL had his weapon malfunction or jam, and then was forced to go hand-to-hand -hand kung fu fight against the bad guys. Three times. <laughs> Get the gun fixed. <laughs> um, those are, those are all pet peeves of mine. And all of these things are easily counteracted by just talking to a gun nut for five minutes or having somebody in your neighborhood who likes guns take you to the range one time and you will be far ahead of most fiction writers. When you also need to make sure that you're using a gun that is correct for your time period. Oh, yes. Yes, yeah, so I see this all the time where basically someone will see something cool in a movie and they're like, ooh, that's a cool gun. I'm going to have this uh, Winchester 1886 lever action in this 1850s period. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, we've even seen movies at the Alamo where they're using Winchester lever action rifles. Yeah. No. No, no actually. No. The battle would have been a lot more lopsided if one side had had repeating firearms and the other side had muskets. <laughs> Once again, a little bit of basic research can fix that. If you're writing something like steampunk or um, a historical novel where they're using... Um, you know, pre-cartridge firearms, so things of, of that nature, you know, muzzle loaders. Oh my gosh, you really need to do your research on that because if you, even if you know a little bit about modern guns, the technology and the techniques of old-fashioned firearms is drastically, extremely different than the manual of arms today. And if you want to see just butchery, read some steampunk where they have <laughs> um, muzzle-loading firearms. You know, you're riding around a giant battle robot in a super zeppelin with a laser beam. You're still using a muzzle loader. It's like, I, I don't know why. But um, it, it, some basic research can key you in on the techniques. It actually makes for good drama. Once you understand the limitations of firearms and how to write them in your sequences, you can, you can make your sequences a lot more interesting and believable by putting in those little tidbits. It's not just for the gun nuts. It's not just for the guys like me in the audience, but everybody will appreciate that attention to detail. I did a, a, a Wild West show for a while, and I had a, a 44 that was a black powder, uh, black powder 44. Most of the rest of the cast was using uh, 22 pistols that had blanks. Um, and I got to be sh the sheriff because I had the biggest gun, but one of the things that we noticed is that every time I discharged my weapon, there was this massive gout of white smoke that took 30 to 40 seconds to clear up. If all of us had been firing black powder weaponry, within 30 seconds of the beginning of the gunfight, nobody would have been able to see anybody else. And this is a detail that gets missed a lot when well, you're talking about black powder weaponry. It's smoky. The first 30 seconds of the fight, suddenly you have the fog of war, quite literally. Yeah. And sound is the other yeah. one people forget. Guns are extremely loud. And you see this all the time in, in fiction where I'm, I'm in a gunfight, bang, 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 bang. Now I'm gonna hold the conversation. <laughs> really? Okay. In real life, shooting without hearing protection doesn't make you tough, it makes you deaf. Mm -hmm. uh, hearing damage is permanent and cumulative, and it does happen. And usually what happens is, under the effects of adrenaline, there are some protections to your, to your ear where it will kind of filter out some of this, but you are still doing permanent hearing damage. And you see some of these fictional characters that, you know, in a book, they'll engage in six or seven gunfights per book for a 12-book series, and they still have all their hearing. No. Um, in, my, in my thriller series, Dead Six, I have um, the main character by the second book. He actually has a, a hearing aid in one ear that he has to use in order to, um, in, in polite society, because he can't hear it on one side of his head. Because in the first book, someone touched off a 44 Magnum next to his face while he was wrestling the guy. In real life, that is going to do severe damage to your ear. Guns are very, very loud. Okay, oh. let's, let's stop here for Book of the Week, which coincidentally is by Larry Correa. Yay! Yay. Tell us for 30 seconds or so about your book. Um, book number two in the Grim Noir Chronicles is called Spellbound. It's out in Audible, um, read by Bronson Pin Show. Wow. Oh, yes. Really? Yeah. Extremely, good, uh, extremely good reader. <laughs> and uh, 
He did a phenomenal job in the first one. The book is a alternate history fantasy set in the 1930s, kind of a noir pulp, magical, epic fantasy, alternate history, gangsters, zeppelins, ninjas. So it has everything. It has everything diesel and the punk. kitchen. It's diesel punk. It is awesome. Men wore hats. <laughs> and, uh, Howard, how can they get a copy uh, of Head on book? out to audiblepodcast.com slash excuse. You can kick off a 14-day free trial membership and download Spellbound by Larry Korea, narrated by Bronson Pinchot at no charge. Okay. Um, let's get into this. I want to dig into a little bit of the, the why should we care. You actually started this, um, Larry. Um, and I'm going to make Dan talk because Dan has not talked very much yet. Oh, he's giving <laughs> frowny face. Dan, why yes. should we care? Why should we care, should we care about, about, accuracy? about accuracy, about firearms? Why do we care if, like, you know, the three gun nuts, beside the fact that they're armed, which is a good reason to care, but let's throw <laughs> that one on. Why, why should we care? Well, one of the things that Larry said is that it actually can make the story itself more interesting. Okay. Um, another thing is just thinking about the realities of guns, whether or not your characters know them, the author thinking about them is going to end up with, in many cases, a much richer story. One of the things that I ran into with uh, my serial killer trilogy is, you know, the, the character John Cleaver, he didn't know anything about guns. The first time he is confronted with a guy who has one, um, I, I mean, the first thing my writing group did was say, oh, he, he's just holding an handgun on him? Well, he's not going to be able to hit him at that range. He can run away. And I thought, really? And so I had to look up, you know, what's the range of accuracy of a handgun? And, it depends. Is it me shooting at you? or? <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, you know, yes, handguns, the, you know, are accurate at a very close distance, and they start becoming very inaccurate the further away you get, much more so than most of you are thinking. And yet, most of you don't know that. And so, if someone pulled a handgun on you from all the way back here... Uh-oh. Dan's um, collar is mic, covering his microphone. Dan, did you do that on purpose because, you know, you feel that um, you want us to take more of the limelight and, you know. Yes, I didn't want to overshadow you all mm. with the melodiousness of all right. my voice. Mary? No, the point okay. that I'm trying to make oh, is... He's going to still have a point. Okay. I still have a point, <laughs> believe it or not. The point I'm trying to make is just because you as an author need to be an expert in the things, the topics you're writing about, doesn't make all of your characters suddenly gun experts. And so you need to know your stuff but they can make some common mistakes as long as you know it. Yeah, it's the and point of view. It's going to be coming yeah. out of the knowledge of the point of view character. It's like the Buffy syndrome where you know, the teenagers can all suddenly kung fu fight vampires because they teamed up. No, it's still going to be based on your own personal skill, knowledge, abilities, and training. Um, Mary, you've got guns in yeah, the book. Yeah, in, uh, in Glamour and Glass, um, which is set in 1815, um, it's a little more swashbuckling. So. Um, so I actually talked to some people who do black powder recreation, and it, one of the things that was interesting was I'm, I'm using a, a, a wheel lock. Um, oh, shoot. This is going to be embarrassing because now I can't remember the word that goes after wheel lock. Wheel lock rifle? No. Wheel lock. It's a gun. Wheel lock. <laughs> it's a gun, and the wheel lock part was the important part. Um, basically, it, it's a wind-up gun, um, and it's slightly older. But it was, uh, in, it was a fancy innovation because it meant that you didn't have to try and light a, a fuse to make your gun go off because that was what predated that. Matchlock. Thank you. Matchlock, yes. That's why we have him here. <laughs> I just needed to know this long enough to write the scene. <laughs> <laughs> I, had, I had to teach it to people. So. Um, but the thing that was interesting about that, I wasn't going to use that initially, but when I was talking to the black powder people, they explained that one of the disadvantages to a wheel lock was that it took a couple of seconds to go off. So you would pull the trigger and you'd have to wait. And I was like, that's perfect if you're trying to get away from it. And if, my, if I've got someone who knows that, that's a piece you can totally use. So that's one reason to try and be accurate, is because it can give you a lot more dramatic tension than you would if you're just using it randomly. The other thing that I want to say is that if you are writing historical stuff, because there are so many people who are passionate about it, it is not difficult to find people who do recreation stuff who will let you come out and try their historical guns or just let you watch them shoot them off. Uh, black powder weapons in particular, in addition to the smoke at, at a full charge, the amount of heat uh, that they kick out is 
pretty significant. Did you get to fire a flintlock or a matchlock? No. Yeah, what I found when I fired, uh, when I fired my first flintlock, which is where there's actually a little powder, a little tiny bit of powder in the pan right in front of your face that the flint and the steel mm -hmm. hit. Yeah, that gun goes off and, and you have to hold it on target while being blinded by this little explosion right in the middle of your face. Um, and then the gun goes off and it's big. Yeah, the reason the British stood in a big line and shot at people wasn't because they thought it looked cool. <laughs> it's just that was the most effective way to make use of the firearms. Because they, as an individual weapon, they had a long way to go before you just start picking people off from mine cover. All right, let's um, have Larry, why don't you take us out? Um, I want you to tell us why you write about guns. What, what is it, a, it it's kind of your thing. Why, why is it so important to you? Well, you always hear that thing, write what you know and write what you love. And it's kind of my thing. And it was my original, audi it was my original target audience was uh, internet gun nuts. And uh, it, they rewarded me, and so I tried to write stories for their enjoyment. And it's had a lot of, a lot of good crossover. And I've actually, I get a lot of comments from people who are not gun people, who don't particularly like firearms, but after reading my books, are like, wow, I really want a gun now. I really want a grenade launcher, and I, and I have done my job. <laughs> All right, um, Howard, you've got a, you've got a uh, writing prompt for us. Okay, writing prompt, give us a character who, after reading one novel, goes out and procures a grenade launcher. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this has been Writing Excuses. You're out of excuses, now go write.